Hello, and welcome to Generation AI, the podcast where we demystify artificial intelligence in the world of higher education. I'm your host, Artis Kudu, joined by my insightful co-host, JC Bonilla. Hey, JC, how's it going? Whoa. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That was woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is our 14th or 15th dropped. I mean, my gosh. We're looking at the stats. I'm excited. We're growing. We are on that midpoint of content. The world continues to just drop technology at us. And today we're going to be talking about conversational chatbots. Just excited, excited. A lot of gratitude also of what's going on on everyone's, I guess, on my life. So I'm in that sweet spot of observing technology, observing family, working hard, and also planning the summer. How's it feeling for you? There's just so much AI news that I have been indoors and catching up and have not <laughs> spent any time outside at all. Pick one. What is the, the one that you're the most excited about? And I give you the same because there's a lot that has happened and we can do a whole episode on catch ups, but just one. We just did one on catch up. So we got to do another one. Today, we're going to talk about conversational chatbots. And before we get there, one of the things that I'm really excited about that just happened is the first model that surpasses GPT-4 on all of the benchmarks. And a lot of the influencers and folks who are testing it that's available today, it's Claude 3 by Anthropic. So Anthropic dropped Claude 3 yesterday. By the time this podcast comes out, it'll probably be a week. And the quality and the responses are really, really great. It's available to be used as part of their website. It's also available on AWS and on Google GCP for production already. By the time this podcast drops, Anthropic 7.2 has dropped. GPT-5. GPT-11.55 <laughs> GPT and Gemini X5 11.52, right? Because they're awesome at names. But remembering everybody that the Anthropic is the AWS, Amazon kind of technology ecosystem, Gemini and Google, OpenAI on Microsoft. So we start continuing to see these cloud service providers pushing, pushing, pushing. Speaking of OpenAI, Microsoft, the news I've been following, of course, controversial. We're not going to go super deep there because there are opinions that we don't want to basically go too much into. But Elon Musk sued OpenAI specifically because, as far as I understood it, a breach of business purpose, right? The intent of Musk in funding OpenAI back in the day, it was a research lab that was going to further the benevolence of um, AI, if anything, but they switched to a business model pro-money, so capitalism wins, and from his point of view, that is a bridge of contract. So we'll see what happens, but a gigantic distraction, in my opinion, to OpenAI as they try and pursue this $7 trillion fundraising, as they try to do the amazing things they're doing. Just, you know, legal battles like this are always, always time suck for CEOs. Uh, yes, this is going to be really interesting to see what happens. So everybody is after OpenAI now. You know, they were the leader <laughs> for a while, and everybody's after the leader. All right, so we'll come back and we'll give you guys a lot more updates as things happen. We wanted to mention these as we're recording this episode, but today we're going to focus on conversational chatbots and exactly how they add value and how they work. When you think about chatbots, they have been around for a really long time, but conversational chatbots built on some of these frontier models like GPT-4 and you know Gemini and even Claude, they are much more capable. And we're going to talk about today how they're built, how they work, and how we think about hallucinations and how we think about the technology around them. One of the really interesting things that I wanted to you know point out is there was a post and there was a report by Klarna, which it's a company out of New York. And Klarna is stating that they are using an open AI bot and they have it globally for one month. And the numbers that they're seeing in terms of the engagement with that bot, they're seeing 2.3 million conversations. Two thirds of Klarna's customer service chats are going through that bot. And one of the big numbers that they're announcing is that that is the equivalent of doing the work of 700 full-time agents, which is amazing, right? If you look at it from a productivity perspective, but this has turned a lot of heads in terms of how AI is actually impacting productivity now in these call centers 
or even in customer support and customer success. Until now, we had bits and pieces of people talking about these bots, but now Klarna has actually come out with this really incredible numbers. And it's saying that it's on par with human agents in regard to the satisfaction scores. It's also leading about 25% drop in repeat inquiries because these things are getting resolved faster, which is amazing. And it's estimating to have about $40 million in profit improvements. Obviously, you know, they're getting ready for an IPO. So this makes a lot of sense for them, but this is not their core business. However, they're seeing huge improvements. And we wanted to talk a lot about these conversational AI bots as they pertain to frontline customer support, customer success, you know, use cases. In our case, a lot of student engagement and student success and student support use cases and, and how they actually work. We wanted to demystify a lot of that today. And Artis, no doubt that this context sets the stage for today. In higher education, the existence of a chat bot, right, a bot has been around. But I'd love for you to explain to us the evolution of student engagement to chat bots. What, what I want to remind everybody before we go there, it's that resource allocation in higher education, whether it's admissions, student services, academic services, whatever we're doing in which the interface of a student with an administrator takes place, the numbers are not in our favor, right? So if we know that there's going to be 5,000 students for, I don't know, three administrators, right? So the deployment of technology, the ability to come and scale this type of interaction that in higher education, whether it's how do I pay my tuition deposit? How do I start my financial aid? Hey, I'm lost in FAFSA. Hey, I want to do canoeing trips. Or how do I do my, I don't know, junior form so I can apply for graduation? All those type of things today potentially could be mediated by technology amplifying the role of an administrator, counselor, whatever that human touch interaction is. And if there's a place where that is needed today, it's in higher education. So Artis, can you set the stage of what is this evolution of chatbots and how do they, you see them on student engagement and support overall? Well, before we get there, I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit because you ran a very successful graduate office, all humans. So you, you had, how many graduate assistants did you have working at that office? Legally speaking, like 30. Illegally speaking, like 150. <laughs> 150 agents. So you had 150 agents. We had, I think, about eight to nine full-time staff members and an army of graduate assistants. I don't know, 30, 40 maybe at our hype. And it was intense, intense networking <laughs> to get in, if you remember. But yeah, so what do you want to know about those days? Well, I want to understand, like, what was the work breakdown? Like, what was the majority of the work? What were you guys handling? So uh, I'll give you three perspectives. The first one is on student discovery of requirements. Hey, do I need a GRE score? If I'm going to come and apply for financial engineering, what is the minimum GRE score? There were about seven questions, I would say, seven to 10 questions that were repeated over and over and the variation of the program overlay. I think we had a close to maybe 30 different graduate programs. So it's from GRS to GPA to ESL requirements to, I don't know, essay or not. How do mm -hmm. I do that? So what you have is students replying to email, phone calls, any kind of form of communication of how do I go and start my application? Number two, once you apply, and we were generating thousands of applications for maybe, I think our admissibility was 60, 70% back then, and we were yielding about 20% of that. So let's say 10,000 applications coming in for 3,000 spots, right? Mm -hmm. So if all these applications moved from one place to another, literally. Here's an application, and then you go in a drawer and you pull the transcripts, or you basically say, check, 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 is ready for an evaluation. And the paper file got moved to an advisor. Towards our last two years, it was all digital. So you're actually adding a digital record, a transcript to a dossier, electronic, and what you push in is an electronic dossier. But that's basically the movement. And the third thing is the Graduate Center was highly social and academic servicing. So we were doing a ton of events. 
<laughs> and scholarship programs and things that our student needed to come and say, hey, how do I apply for this scholarship? Hey, can you please give me an exception? Can you come and talk to my dad and my mom because I lost my scholarship? Or I know you're doing this, you know, student sponsorship. How do I get more money or how do I get the activities? All that kind of stuff. So in a nutshell, those were the three types of activities that we did. Interesting. So managing, scheduling events, answering questions for students, and of course, moving their applications through. And I know what your head is thinking. 80% of the things that we did were repeatable and replicable, like always saying the same thing, right? 80% easy, right? So you couldn't gotten to your legal limit of having only 15 graduate assistants instead of 40, if you only had AI back then. My friend, we controlled the graduate assistance program, the budget. So we just basically had overhead. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I'm kind of poking at this is because that was, you know, one of the first times that I saw a large operation of folks actually handling inquiries coming in from students. And it was very repetitive. And we were trying to help out from this perspective of the website. We were trying to make information more findable, RFIs to become a little bit more easier to funnel through those programs. But a lot of questions were coming in. So Fast forward, that's been longer than 10 years, 15 years or 12 years. That was from 2004 to 2012. 2012, yeah. So over 12 years, yeah. You're an old fart. You're an old fart, buddy. <laughs> yes, we are. We are. Uh, we're getting really old. We're looking today at some of the benefits of AI and these conversational chatbots as the front lines. You also ran an international office. So making sure that you had people who could answer those questions in different languages was really important. I remember, you know, Asia was a big target for you guys to recruit a lot of students from. South America became really, really important. Of course, you were bilingual, but, you know, you couldn't answer all those questions. So anyways, the point is that the type of inquiries that were coming in and the types of conversations were very diverse. So thinking about these chatbots over the past decade plus, we now have had a lot of automation in those call centers or kind of this first line of defense. And chatbots have been one of the main ways that we've tried to alleviate that first interaction. It's like, if you ask for something, why not just answer a chatbot? And the first chatbots were very, very simple, right? They were actually, they weren't chatbots as, at, at all. There was somebody live on the other side. It was actually called live chat. So those are the first incarnations of what we see today as the chatbot bubbles on the websites, but they were manned by somebody and it was somebody's job to man those. And sometimes you had different shifts and so on and so forth. So we moved away and we tried to introduce automation in there. And we said, hey, we have these 10 questions that are going to be the same questions. And let's just load those questions in there and have some answers to them. And what the chatbot was trying to do from a technical perspective was try to match based on keyword that somebody asked. If they said financial aid, the chatbot would come up and would match the keywords to those questions and then kind of provide the answer, uh, a pre-canned answer. If the conversation continued and went in the different directions, then we were really not able to provide those answers. Or if something was asked that didn't make sense to the bot, they couldn't answer those. So it was very, very simple, right? Tree-based keyword matching questions, and you had to enter all of those questions in there. This is like two years ago, right? Yeah, it's exactly. And in the, as you do this kind of walk through how it used to work to like maybe two years ago, what I want everybody to remember is that the finite state of chatbots or these type of decision trees as we know them is that if you load them with 17 variations, 17 FAQs, if you will, 17 options to like, you know, for English first one, like for whatever, that's it. That's all the options that you had, knowing that there's always option zero, you know, for an agent mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, we haven't done that. That was about two years ago, right? And there's been a uh, kind of knowledge centers in this autonomous computing that have done a little bit better artists, but up until kind of generative AI, we didn't really have an opportunity to have, these are my 17 questions, but now technology that could really generate answers for variations of those, language to your earlier point, but also the 15 questions that have not been answered yet. And that's some of the exciting things that you're gonna come and unpack. But to this point, the history you told us, it was a finite number of answers. 
And it was just basically the interaction of either phone or email or FAQ that kind of gave us that kind of range of possibility. Or the conversation, to your point of one. These are conversational interfaces. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, it was very, very simple, right? So we we had a finite amount. So if somebody asked a question in a different language... You shit out of luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, or if you asked it a little bit differently, you know, we weren't able to respond to that. So fast forward to generative AI enters the scene, and now we saw GPT-2 about two years ago when GPT-2 was becoming really good at producing language that was coherent and producing text that was coherent. We started to see some of that, you know, possibility in there, but it wasn't viable yet to introduce this into products or into chatbots until OpenAI had introduced ChatGPT. And then we saw these conversational interfaces blow up because ChatGPT was essentially a chatbot built on top of these large language models that were very, very good at carrying a conversation and being very natural in that way. So can I, for everyone following the conversation, so the conversational interface, it's what in chat, GPT, whatever version or open AI, right? That's how your prompt interface looks like, right? And then you put in your prompt and it gives you something. Yes. Behind the scenes is the LLM, which we've been talking a lot about, right? And today's conversation is about conversational interfaces. What are we unpacking as we do this journey? Is the LLM and how to listen to those things or just mostly on that interface? What do you think to do today? Yeah, we're, we're focusing specifically on the chatbot, right? So conversational interfaces are going to be a much wider area that are going to be introduced in a lot of different products and how you interact with software. We've been talking about this a little bit, but we're going to focus on a smaller footprint, which is actually the chatbot or the AI assistant area. So these AI bots or AI chatbots and how have they progressed and how they work. So everybody understands because there's a lot of questions that come up over and over again. And we hear those questions a lot at Element when folks are asking, well, do I still have to build my question library, a Q&A library? Do I still need to enter different languages or so on and so forth? So a lot of those questions come up for us and we're hoping to go through and answer some of those questions during the podcast and also figure out how schools can go through and evaluate these products and evaluate these technologies and how they can actually use them today to eliminate a lot of the frontline work that they're doing. Hey everyone, Art is here, founder and CEO of Element 451. I'm thrilled to invite you to the Engage Summit in Raleigh, June 25th and 26th. It's our annual gathering where AI and higher education come together in exciting ways. A lot of the sessions will focus on cutting edge AI, that are reshaping student experience, they're enhancing staff productivity, and offering deep insights into your data. Imagine two days filled with hands-on sessions, real success stories, and the chance to network with top minds in the field. You live with practical, transformative takeaways as you learn how AI can foster a more personalized, efficient approach from recruiting to student success and even to alumni engagement. Oh, and the best part? Engage Summit is incredibly affordable. Try discount code Enrollify50, that's Enrollify50, and you can register for just $99. So join me and many of my fellow Enrollify network creators at Engage Summit this coming June. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. We can't wait to see you there. Hello listeners, it's Mallory Wilsey, chief producer of the Enrollify Network, and I want to tell you about another show on our podcast network that I think you'll love. Visionary Voices, the College President's Playbook, is an insightful podcast dedicated to the strategic minds leading today's higher ed institutions. Each episode brings a unique perspective from visionary and tech-forward college presidents, chancellors, and other high-level academic leaders, diving into the complexities and nuances of running a modern educational institution. This show is hosted by Dr. Brian Gross, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Athletics at Hartwick College, and is a valuable resource for current and aspiring leaders in academia offering a playbook of visionary ideas and practical solutions for the ever-evolving landscape of higher ed. 
New episodes drop every other Wednesday, and you can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Visionary Voices wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's do it. So as we moved on through introduction of ChatGPT, a lot of us were very appreciative of the conversational interface that ChatGPT and what he was able to produce. However, when you ask it very direct questions or factual questions, just like you said, when is the deadline for X or what is the deadline for Y? It doesn't know that information because it's not being trained on that data and it has a cutoff knowledge of the world. So any model that gets trained on data, it understands data that's been you know, ingested, but it can't give you something that it's not been trained on. And in that case, when you ask it those questions, I would say the fault and the beauty of this large language model, generative AI, it's always going to generate something. And those some things that don't make sense are called hallucinations. So it's making up things if you ask it a question that it doesn't know the answer to or it's not in the training data set it's going to make up those answers and it's going to be very convincing that this is the right answer. So we call those hallucinations. And that's not really good for chatbots that we want answers from that we can deploy in our institutions or we can deploy in our businesses, right? So ChatGPT was great, but a lot of people, if you remember early days, they they didn't trust it because they were asking, what do you know about me? Or the very quintessential questions that you, you, you ask any new technology is, of course, very selfish. And people were dismissing it because they just didn't understand what the power of these tools were all about. So what happened since then, it's now how can we take ChatGPT and actually embed it and kind of put our own data on it so we can build the same type of level of interaction and the conversation within our guardrails of our data, our knowledge base. So tools and a lot of the work that we've been doing at Element since basically over a year and a half now has been around how do we use this brain, this large language models, reasoning capabilities, and bring it to the school's data so they can answer and be guard railed with schools. I mean, it sounds very, very simple, but there's a lot of different components that go into that. And that's what I wanted to kind of go over. And we can go one by one on these different components today. All right. So let me ask you a question. When you were training your graduate assistants, like what was your training material? Like if they did not know a question, where did they go? There was some type of documentation or like a flow, right, that they will have to follow. But mostly it's this idea of osmosis, apprenticeship, right? They see it, they work, and they kind of copy it, right? So because we didn't have that knowledge base, it's kind of look at me work and they do it. The second thing that happens on that one, specifically when the answer is verbal, they hear it once and they understand and they repeat it, which brings me to an aspect of just because they got trained, that doesn't mean that they did it the right way. They did it their own way, right? So it was really interesting. But anyway, long story short, osmosis, they see it apprenticeship-like type of thing. I mean, obviously you mentioned knowledge bases and knowledge bases are a way for an organization to have their information or a department or anyone to have a piece of that information can be referenced by other people. So we don't have to lose that knowledge. It's the same thing here. And the way that these bots are built that are specific to a school is we have a knowledge base and that bot is trained. It's not necessarily trained, but we are pulling information from the knowledge base and we're saying, based on this information, answer this question. So the hallucination goes away because we use the large language model as just the brain. It's doing the reasoning. However, every time you get asked a question, it goes back and says, hold on, let me look that up for you. We go to our book and we look up the answer or we read a couple of paragraphs, we synthesize those paragraphs and we provide you the answer back. So if you think about our brains and our capability to kind of take information and synthesize it, 
that is kind of the essence of how these bots work. Now we can go into a lot of details on what do they mean exactly? So we're gonna go through a few questions. First question is, are there differences in what types of models you use for these bots? And how does that affect you know, the responses? That is a question that we come up with a lot. And as these models have been evolving over time, we have seen a huge difference in the way that these bots are able to take in a question and are able to respond back to it. Are you talking about tonality? No, I'm actually talking about the ability for a model to answer multi-intent type of questions and nuanced questions. So it's like, you can ask me a question and I need to understand what you're saying and what's your intent before I actually give you an answer back based on some knowledge that I can have or I go retrieve. So in a lot of cases, we're able to answer questions that are more complex or more nuanced because these models are much better. So chat GPT-4, for example, is much, much better at answering some of the more nuanced questions than GPT-3.5. Uh, it's much, much better than some of the open source models, right? So, so you can answer nuanced questions, like you can ask multi-intent type of questions as well. So I guess what you're saying to contextualize it is I'm calling in the you know graduate center, student admissions office. Hey, I'd like to know when is this event taking place? So the operator is like, oh, sure, which event? Are you a prospective student, an applicant? Because potentially there are 11 type of events that are happening concurrently. So what you're saying is in the algorithm, the model has the incentive to either authenticate you, this is a prospective student, do all these type of things, and maybe from what is the event, provide an answer, or stage other questions, if you will, the operator, and then facilitate it. Is that kind of the, a good example of going from assumptions based on the information that it is and provides the answer versus let me solicit more information and then provide the answer? So that is part of it, right? The ability for it to know how to follow up with questions and how to do that, that's part of it. But let me amend your example. You call in and you just don't ask a question, when is the event tonight? You say, hey, I'm coming in for this event. What time is it? And can I come alone? How many people can I bring? So you have three different intents in there. It's like, you're telling me that you're coming. You're asking me a question about what time is this, so I need to give you that information. And then you're also asking me, what do you need? So now you have this three different intents in, kind of bundled up in this one chat bubble, and the brain or the ability for that model to decompose that and, and kind of make reasoning about it, that's where the better frontier models are able to give you better answers. That's why when you go to GPT 3.5, sometimes you're like, oh man, I asked it a lot of these questions and he wasn't able to answer me correctly. And then GPT 4, it's like you can ask it this really incredible prompts and is able to follow your instructions very clearly. It's exactly what we're talking about here. All right. So moving on now, the part that this is the, the confusion where it happens a lot around hallucinations. It's like, okay, well, how does this work? How does this memory work? So you have your brain, you have your knowledge, but how does the memory work? And we have a technique that is used throughout. It's called RAG. So retrieval augmented generation. So this is a technique that is used in order to bring in context or data to the LLM, to the model, and essentially say, here's some question, and here is the context that you need to answer that question. So using an, your analogy of someone calls in and gives me three questions in one, here the context is that this person, it's very aggressive right now on the phone. He looks to be in a hurry. So let me give you the answer right away, right? So at five, like, I don't know, you can come alone and you need your FAFSA form, right? That's the context. That's the rag in how it applies that it brings these other externalities onto the model fulfillment. And then based on that, it gives the answer. Is that a good application of rag? Well, let's modify it a little bit. It's about the, the sources of information. Why do you keep on modifying my examples? They're not good enough today. <laughs> well, your examples are great. This is great because these are some of the questions that obviously, if I'm able to explain it to you, then it means that, you know, we're doing a good job in terms of explaining to the audience as well or to, to our <laughs> listeners. 
I'm doing this for you, listeners. I'm doing this for you, okay? We're role playing here. Go, go. JC is playing dumb for sure. When you when those questions come in, you now have to go look what time is the event. So you have an event reference database or you have a knowledge base where you have a list of all your events. So you're going in, you're reading your sheet or you're reading something as your graduate assistants and you're reading the event or your event module, your website. You're also going in and pulling in some information around what are the requirements that that student needs based on the program that they're coming in, the event that they're coming in for. So now you're pulling in these two pieces of information and you're bringing them to the context. So that's what we're calling the context. So you're retrieving the data that you need in a raw format. You're essentially getting the, the schedule as a piece of paper, which has all the events in there. You're also getting the requirements. You're bringing them together. Your brain is making reasoning and it's saying, okay, for this event, this is what you need. This is the timing for this program. This is the requirements. And then you shorten that and you provide it. Okay, you can come at six o'clock and you can bring in your completed application or you can bring in your transcript. And that's it. That's the answer. But you needed to basically go ahead and retrieve this information and augment the context. So that's the that's what we're talking about. So the idea of retrieval augmented generation means that we are now pulling data from some kind of database or some kind of knowledge base that is external, that belongs to the company. In this case, it can be a CRM that you're pulling data from. It can be a knowledge base that you're pulling data from. And then you're bringing that data into the context. And then you're saying, answer this question based on this data context. There is a couple more techniques that we go through in order to make these, these retrievals or this information more accurate. And one of the things that is done and one of the things that we do is, well, we talked about this in the prior episode around knowledge bases and semantic search, right? So semantic search, in order for us to pull the right information from our knowledge base, we semantically need to understand, you know, what the question is and what that intent is. And then how do we retrieve the right pieces of information from our knowledge base? So in this case, we use what's called the vector database, where we're not looking for keywords, but we transform our information into vectors, which are semantic meanings of information like text or audio or video or images. And then we can look up that similarity or, or we pull content that is very similar in meaning to what we're asking. However, let's say that we scan hundreds of pages from our website and some information, there's different competing information. Some of it is better than other. And we have thousands or millions of different chunks of text in our database. When we search for it, we can miss a piece that might be very important to answer that question, right? Because this retrieval, it's semantic, but it's not trying to find keyword exactly what the user asked. We're just basically providing a short corpus of information so the model and the brain can actually scan through. Rather than scanning the whole library, we just pick a catalog book, right? Like one of the card index and we say, oh, this type of question can be found in this you know, book. And then we go pick up that book from the library and bring it in. So now we can look up the answer in there. So we're doing exactly the same thing here. However, sometimes we can have two or three books and we need to make sure that we're kind of ordering the importance of those books. So there is a process called re-ranking this pieces of information. And then we pull in the top X amount of those pieces of text. So once we do that, that's another process that we go through, we bring it in to the context and we send that data back to the LLM and we say, okay, now answer this question. And then the LLM gives us the answer back on that. Now, imagine this loop happening over and over again, and imagine not only do we bring in data from the context, but we also are working with databases that are retrieving real-time information like student information around, is this a graduate student? What program are they part of? You know, all of those pieces and putting them in the context in order to handle that. What do you think? A little bit more complex than question and answer. I mean, and, and this is why the unpacking of what an AI chatbot is so significant, right? Because in theory, what we just basically are able to deploy, it's that semantically speaking, a query, it's complicated, check, 
the technology can understand the nature of your query, which, where there is one questions or five questions in two, then in looking for the answer, it's able to make the connections and re the retrieval to multiple systems, multiple places of information, whether it's financial aid with a twist of student services, with a twist of alumni, and you know, give it this student affair aspect. It gives you an output or a semi-output that is ranked. So it's not going to give you the entire student catalog. It's actually going to say, oh, this is only for financial engineering. So it gives you financial engineering and the student services is all the I don't know, extracurricular stuff, whatever. And then finally, through all these motions going over and over, that's how you end up with a human-like chatbot unlike the things that we started conversation two years ago, that just look like a decision tree that I only envisioned 17 variations. And God forbid you ask me the 17 questions all at once because it goes crazy. He doesn't know how to do it. Although he knows how to answer 17 things, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So some of the downfalls of this are you have information that is not relevant to those questions. So you're not able to find that information. And in a lot of cases, you know, that happens. So having AI ready content and keeping up to date with that knowledge base is really, really important. But one of the issues that we ran into as we're kind of building these bots is the encoding of that semantic data in order for us to retrieve the most relevant pieces of information. So it's very easy to build this chat bot just by using OpenAI's API and somebody can build them themselves. They can build them internally, but it's it's mostly a proof of concept. So you're building it and it looks great because you're like, oh, look, I'm actually able to answer questions. I'm able to pull some data and, and provide it to the bot. And I have a PDF that I can pass in, or I have some piece of text and OpenAI and a ChatGPT has even provided you the ability to load in documents. So it does some of that RAG component. However, when you start going to a domain knowledge and you start thinking, okay, well, how do I encode and what kind of embeddings do I use for that knowledge base? Do I use embeddings that are more multilingual? Like if your question comes in in a different language, are we still able to find that embedding because we use the multilingual you know, type of embedding? Or are we encoding that correctly? Are we decomposing the document and doing some transformations on it? So that's where we had to do a lot of work. It wasn't necessarily in the flow of the bot. It was mostly around how do we encode that data the right way so we can pull very relevant information to do this RAG approach. And that it's a little bit of an art and science when it comes down to it. And we have to do a lot of back and forth and re-encode a lot of the data over time. But we've gotten really, really good at that. That's going to be something that is not going to necessarily go away. It's going to get a lot easier as we get more of these tooling and databases around it. But I want to talk about the multilingual component and how does that work in an LLM? So, you know, we mentioned that you had actual different grad assistants for different countries because they could speak the dialect. They understood exactly what they were saying. So this multilinguality is inherent for certain models. You can do multilingual very well. So not only can GPT-4 do multilingual because we encode and we have those embeddings with some of the multilingual kind of models for the embedding, but also it can reason in that language as well. And it can switch between what is the input that's coming in. If it's a different language, then I'm going to provide the answer in that different language within the same conversation, right? So it can switch back and forth. And, and that was amazing for us because by using some of the frontier models, we got some of that multilinguality being part of the bot, which was amazing because these frontier models were being trained on a lot of different languages. I believe it was anywhere between 70 to 100 different languages for GPT-4. Really quickly for everyone who's trying to understand the multilinguality, right? So all the rag in this augmentation, and it, let me just use the word, the map and ecosystem of data points, right? There may be in English, right? Because your school is you're based in the States. Now, you know, little Johnny in Turkey is asking a question in Turkish, right? Multilingual aspect. So does the question itself get translated so that it gets basically using this kind of vector database linkage and similarity, finds the answer in English, right? Semantically, 
does the whole indexing thing that you mentioned all in English and then translates back? Or is it something more nuanced than that? So in other words, the way humans work, specifically for someone going to English as a second language, is that you have your domain knowledge in your dominant language, right? For me, it was it used to be Spanish. Now that I'm a you know English speaker, I'm literally bilingual. But back in the day, I heard the question, I translated it, I did whatever my brain needs to do, I find the answer, and I translated it back. How are these chatbots doing that? Yeah, so it's not a translation. There's no translation. These are inherent understanding of those languages because they've been trained on those language data as well. Some languages are better than others, so it understands some nuance. So it's going to write much better English prose, and it's going to write much better reasoning. But the language is inherent to you know, how these bots were trained. Essentially, what happens is that you translate or you create tokens out of all languages in the world, out of all corpuses of text. And then these tokens have different representations. They get converted into vector space, and then you train based on that. So one of the components in there is like, okay, is this English? Is this what type of language it is? You know, all of those pieces. So everything gets standardized, so to speak. All the different data sets get standardized. So it understands and speaks as if it's speaking in all languages at the same time. Because you're not saying, by the way, that if for it to answer a Turkish question, right, the chatbot needs to be trained in Turkish. What you're saying, right, is that because this vector technique, right, in a way, it neutralizes language and it can handle all the languages in the world. Not all the languages. No, not all the languages in the world. It's trained on Turkish language. So the RAG will happen in the native language? Okay, that's important. Well, yeah, yeah. The model itself has the capability, but the RAG also has the capability because it's trained on all these different languages. So when you encode something, you encode it in a vector space. So if you use the same word for Apple in Turkish and the same word for Apple in Spanish, it's going to find Apple in the vector space because it's right in the same place, right? They have the same meaning. It doesn't matter what the language is. So that's how we're able to pull in English text or whatever text that you have. If the question is in Spanish, we're able to kind of pull that in. So that's a really good nuance because it takes a little bit of time to understand that this vector space and, and how these embeddings work. So the last part is kind of this, okay, you had assistants, but they actually had to carry certain skills or they had to do certain things, right? They had to go in and schedule an appointment for that student, you know, and, and start an application or, or give them a status of the application. So we need to bring that to our bots as well, right? We call them, you know, what we call agents or skills for that matter. It's how do we teach the bot to go through this process of reasoning and use tools? So when an answer comes in, now it becomes a little bit more complex, right? Now we have to reason about what the intent of that question is. And then we say, oh, they want to get an application. And by the way, we have a tool that does this. So the model says, hey, here is the tool that you should be using because it has access to all these tools that we have built. And this is not on the large language side, by the way, this is on the tool builder on the element. We build all these different tools, but the model actually tells us, hey, this is the intent and you should use this tool because you told me the list of tools that you have available and I'm just picking one. So then we go back, we use that tool, we get the information that we need, we retrieve our database or we get whatever information, we come back, we tell the model, okay, here is the result of that. It goes back and it does what's called a chain of thought. So it goes through this process multiple times in order to get to a final answer after it's done using all the tools, it goes back and kind of evaluates his answers and says, okay, now am I complying with what the original question or intent was and goes back and uses other tools if it needs more context or if it needs to do something else that was generated from that first tool. So we go through this process multiple times and now when you ask, can you schedule an appointment for me? It will go back to the database. It will look for all the available appointments, come back to you, give you some options and say, great, here are some options. Which one do you want? 
You pick one, it will go back, it will use those tools, it will save that in the database, it will kick off an email, come back to you and say, okay, I reserved your appointment for you. So that's how these tools work. These bots are not just about answering questions, they're about using these skills and these tools that you built in there. And they can get very, very sophisticated and once they get more sophisticated, we call them agents because they're able to do multiple things. You're kind of having little mini bots within, you know, the big main interface. It's an agent or a skill, the same thing as a permission level. How, how, how do we think through this? Because what I'm hearing you say, right, is as I go through all these things from the data point of view, then the skill or the agent is I can basically provide you a list of options on events, but then I can also reserve you an event and then I can confirm it. So if, very simplistically, that's at least three skills. Look for the event, provide the option, and then reserved, and then confirm, actually four options. So I'm gonna go back to admissions 101, but you know, 15 years ago. So I will never allow a student to say, yes, I can see that your application is in and you've been admitted, denied, right? So I never gave them the permission to disclose, render decisions. So can you kind of just do a little bit of agent skill versus permissioning? So all the permissioning happens because we're interfacing with our APIs, right? So these agents are using the APIs in order to go through and pull this information. So rather than moving and, and giving you a dashboard or giving you a piece of UI or interface, we are going through these conversational interfaces, hence the conversational chatbots or conversational interfaces that we talk a lot about because we're eliminating the UI and the button that you go click and view. We're letting the LLM or these bots interface directly with our APIs to pull data. And that API respects the permissions that we have set for it, the same permissions as if it was in the UI. So as a higher education administrator, I should not be worried that it will hallucinate on decisions because unless the agent has not been rendered or the skill has not been rendered, it will not know how to do that part, right? So in that way, it's a fail-safe type of guardrail. The AI is deployed. Exactly, exactly. Okay, how much is it? I want to buy it. I'm buying an element right now. You sold me on it. <laughs> 12 years ago, you'd buy it. No, I still like my students, my 45 students who never pay attention, right? <laughs> I know. Well, a bot, you know, they will not go to the bar with you afterwards, so... They will not go to the bar, they did not talk back, and by the way, it was like, I don't know, $15 an hour or $12 an hour back then, you know, that was big money, right? So the ability to do this faster and cheaper is just incredible. Without saying that, you got me at cheaper and faster. Yeah, yeah. And... Imagine they're trained on day one. And, and that's something that is taken for granted, right? Because when we spoke about the retrieval and the cycle of doing it, one of the things that happen in a very human way is that we do this all the time, right? Tell a story and you tell it differently, right? Narrative sometimes is performative, right? And then you do it differently and that, you know, the word changes and whatnot. So if I told someone, this is the script repeated, guess what? When they did it in their own style, it was not the same. With a chatbot, the delivery, it's scripted. So you can actually deploy what you intended without losing anything. So information fidelity, if you will, in terms of a proxy or in a metric, 10 times, a thousand times better in terms of fidelity than doing it through humans, because we just always add our je ne sais quoi, and never mind translating, right? I never knew what the students were saying, you know, once they translated. But it's a really important feature that now we have through chatbots, that information fidelity, it's consistent with the source. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So it's always the same. It's always there 24-7 in multiple languages. It's able to reach into your databases and your tools to get information. So it's able to retrieve and augment and then generate, you know, all those answers for you that you need. So what do you think? I mean, do you have any more questions? Do you think I have explained this well enough? No, no, I mean, you, this is an amazing, you know, technological journey that tells me where I'm at today. I'm just literally curious if you could look forward. Where is this going? Maybe just from the point of view element or any other technologies, but I know what I can do now, but what is the art of the possible here? What is going to happen, right? Where do you think this is going? So as we build these tools and these agents, 
we are moving to a world where they're getting really, really good at following certain intents. And now think about this as giving goals to your agents rather than from internal perspective, we can give them goals. So, so we talked about it's from the student perspective. So the student comes in, they interact with them. Perfect. They might have different personas. So we build different personas for them so they can interact with someone who is a very friendly admissions, you know, frontline person, but then also can interact with someone who is a little bit more rigid academic advisor. So these bots are not just for admissions or they're not just for the front lines, for example, on recruiting or enrollment or prospective students. They're also available for current students as well. So they're able to provide academic information because now they can reach into course catalogs and they can say, hey, this makes a lot of sense, you know, based on the, the description of the course, you can tell that student that there's this sections available and perhaps based on your interest, you might want to take this course versus this one, because I went ahead and read the descriptions because you didn't, you know, you know what I mean? Like those are the things that we're doing. So that's on the student side. But when you think about these agents and, and kind of, we talk about them as AI assistants, right? Because they're really assistants. These AI assistants are going to be more goal oriented where we can have this AI assistants to have a marketing, you know, assistant or a campaign assistant. And we just give them some goals and we say, here's a segment of students and can you make sure that, you know, they apply. And now they have a kind of a library of techniques and every single time that that student has some new piece of information in the system, the agent and the assistant can go in and reevaluate that student and say, what's the next best action that I can perform on this student in order to move them, to nudge them to this phase? So because of that reasoning capability and because of some of the secret sauce that you'd provide in that context on how to do certain things, those tools, right, that we put in there, we can build in autonomous agents that we give them goals. And then now they're able to move and perform autonomously all of the different tasks that are required in between to get people to those goals. So now that's where we're moving to and we're going, but we're going to provide a lot more of these assistance for being very specialized in different things. Like I said, they're going to be a designer assistant versus a campaign builder assistant versus a academic advisor assistant versus an admissions advisor. Those are very different personas and skills that each one of those agents or assistants, I guess we're using the word interchangeably now, but we'll stick with the word assistants are going to need to be able to do. So the goal-oriented aspect of, of a chatbot, in a way, it's asking or putting the pressure on the higher education leader, right? to understand the redeployment of technology in pursuit of student journeys, uh, the student experience that we want our students to truly have. Because what I'm hearing from you is that the potential here is, look, this student, she just wants to crush through it. And we know those students, right? So let me have a set of actions and technology that takes Sarah into us, you know, 13 touch points over eight weeks, right? But now I have Bobby and his mom, and they're like the typical 18-month, you know, student discovery, 55 touch points. And oh my gosh, you know, the second one, not only it's longer, but it's very expensive. And the probability of us dropping the ball on them, it's high, right? Because they email me every five months. So of the context of five months ago, I lost it. But all of a sudden, none of those things are done. Or the micro goal of... Your job is just to make sure that when they, I don't know, they are coming to the event, they get the directions real time. <laughs> like those little things, right? It's just exciting, but it puts the pressure on your, uh, leaders to slice and dice the experience that they want to do, right? They want to motivate the agents and skills that they want to throw, right? Or sourcing the right technologies that are like element that already thought about that and it kind of gives you that point of view. So that's why these podcasts and these educational things that we're doing are so important because what is happening is that you can do so many things, but understanding how you're going about it, the decisions you need to make or the investments that you need to make, it's all the game, right? Yeah, exactly. 
like a developer or somebody can say, hey, let's just build this because we can do it. I want to play around with this AI stuff and I'm going to build it. But there is this whole ecosystem of tooling around it that you need to support in order to get this cutting edge performance out of them, right? So yeah, I mean, sometimes as leaders, we have to make decisions about build versus buy, technology maintenance, technology adoption. So yeah. Hopefully we gave you a lot of that insight today in like, what are some of the questions that you should be asking around these technologies? You know, how the vendors are thinking about, you know, this knowledge bases, the multilinguality, do they have skills? Are they tied into your systems or to that data so you can provide these better answers? Like those are the things that we hopefully have given you a little bit of a peek behind the scenes on how these technologies work or demystify them a little bit for you so you can actually ask those questions when you're adopting these techs. Artis, thank you so much for the deep dive. Super fun and the possibilities are endless. So I encourage everybody to start thinking about what is it that you do repetitively, consistently? As I said in the outset, it felt like 80% of the things that we did in the office were always repetitive. So look at what you do in your office as your deployment of your services through the lens of, we always do this. And at that point, agents, chatbots, AI, it's your best companion or your assistant, if you want to use that word. Exactly. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. If you like this episode, share it with your network. Please hit that follow-up button wherever you listen to your podcast. It would mean a lot to us, and you can get that episode right away when it drops next time. Until next time, see you. See you, everybody. Generation AI is part of the Enrollify podcast network. If you like this podcast, chances are you're going to like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing weekly, and we've got a wide range of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed leaders and professionals like you find their next big idea, They feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts, like Jamie Hunt, Seth O'Dell, Jenny Lee Fowler, Brian Gross, and many of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform that's helping institutions all over the country create meaningful, personalized, and engaging connections with their prospects and students. Learn more at element451.com.